Hey, it's Wednesday, Raider Nation. It means that's time for you to speak to us. Yes, we're always yapping at you. You get to yap at us with the Raider Nation mailbag. Mo Moten, Scott Branson, back with you here. Silver and Black Today is an Odyssey original podcast. We appreciate your support. We appreciate you guys here being here. We appreciate your subscription, so please subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen to us, whether it's Apple, Google, Spotify, doesn't matter. You can find Mo and I there in your speaker and we're glad to talk to you about Raider Nation. Yes, it's been a tough week coming off the Tennessee loss, but we got some great questions, as we always do. And yes, they're not always happy, as this week you can imagine. There's some people that are a little frustrated, Mo, but uh, overall we have great listeners. So even when they're frustrated and somewhat questioning whether or not God exists because the Raiders are bad again, um, their questions do come across a little more positive. But I'm going to start off our good friend John Davis, a longtime listener, goes way back to me with me down uh, in, in Las Vegas on CBS Sports Radio. John asks, Mo, do you think McDaniel's ego is getting in the way? Maybe he thinks that he doesn't need to run the ball because he's smarter or his play calling is superior. I don't know. It was just a thought. That is our good friend, John Davis. And Mo, we talked about this yesterday on Tuesday's show, Josh mm-hmm. McDaniels, the play calling, the, the game planning, that maybe he th- this mad genius of the offense is too much inside his head and not keeping it as simple as he should. Remember I said back in the offseason, all the headlines were about Devontae, Adams, Hunter, Renfro, Darren Waller, and his passing attack. I think Josh McDaniels might have read too much of those, too many of those news clippings. I think he fell in love with what the Raiders have in the passing game. And he's basically ignored or been reluctant to hand the ball to Josh Jacobs in that talented running back room. So I think, I, I don't know if it's ego, but I, I just think he probably looks at his room, his, uh, his playmakers and says, I got Derek Carr, who I wanted when I was in New England. I got Devonta Adams. I got Darren Waller. I got Hunter Renfro. We're going to go pass heavy. I know Josh Jacobs is a good back, but we got multiple playmakers. And Mac Collins is coming along. He leads the Raiders in receiving yards. We got guys who could stretch the field and score a bunch of touchdowns and flurries. But as I said in the last show on Tuesday, you need balance. You don't you don't necessarily have to run the ball, you know, 30, 40 times, but you have to give teams, you have to force teams to respect the run. And I don't yes. think enough teams respect the run when it comes to the Raiders. And I think Josh McDaniels, that's something he has to adjust to. I said this in the Sports Not column. He says he's learned from his mistakes in Denver, right? So let's see if he's really learned from his mistakes and he addresses those blind spots because he has to adjust going forward. Yeah, there's no no question there, uh, Mo. And uh, it's 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 interesting just because uh, it's not. The, I knew this team would have challenges. You know, we had we had listeners. Uh, who say, oh, they're going to go 17 and 0. Of course, that's just fans being fans, and God bless them. But at the same time, we knew that there would be rough spots. I just mm-hmm. had no clue that the rough spots would be this bad, number one, and number two, uh, that they would be in some of these areas from star players, from perhaps a lack of leadership during practice, during the week. I don't know. It just seems very odd to me. But, John, we appreciate your question, uh, as always, and and it goes back to something Mo's been talking about for a couple weeks, so we appreciate it. All right, our good friend Gary Harkin Reader uh, writes in again. I think this is the second out of the four shows that he's done. He says, "Hey guys, uh, after yesterday's debacle, I'm not sure the Raiders can win any games, though the offensive." <laughs> Jesus, <laughs> I, know. I told you. But, but he does it in a really nice way. So, um, though the offensive line played better, I think Carr doesn't have confidence in it to hold up. So he rushes his progressions. That's a good point. I want to get to that. Like you, I don't want to hear any more talk. It's put up or shut up time. The big money guys need to do more than just mail it in. This includes McDaniels and Ziegler. It's like having a high-performance car, but it's on blocks with the motor still needing to be tuned. Um, we, re- we read this one. Uh, last week is too, and I wanted to bring it up because he sent it to me again, and it's basically the same question modified a little bit for this game. Uh, but mm-hmm. you look at that offensive line. Do you think I, Carr isn't getting the ball off as fast as he has in the past? I don't know if he's rushing his progressions, but it doesn't seem like he's trusting and and reading the field. I thought last year he did a much be- much better job of going through his progressions. Now I don't think, I don't know that it's rushing it. I don't think he's getting to all of them. I don't, I can't pinpoint it because I don't know what's in his head, but there's something off about Carr. Now he hasn't played terribly. 
He's been he's not the reason the Raiders are losing this game, but he hasn't been able to elevate them to win these games either. And part of that is because of his offensive line. Now, I can't speak for Carr, and Carr is not going to – we know how Carr operates on the podium. He's not going to badmouth his teammates or call out a player publicly. So when they ask him about the offensive line, the switch is specifically on the right side. He goes, well, I don't even really notice the guys in and out of the lineup, and I, I don't I don't completely buy that. But no. he goes, I don't – the guys out there, you know, whoever's out on the field is doing a good job, and I don't even notice the switches and substitutions because I'm worried about what I'm doing. And I, and I would say – you understand that you don't have the offensive line that you had maybe five, six years ago when you had car insurance, guys like Kelechi Assembly in his prime, Rodney Hudson, Donald Penn when he was still pretty good. Uh, you don't have those guys there anymore. You know you have an inex- inexperienced guys in starting roles. So I, I don't buy that that doesn't play back in his head. Like, I got to get rid of the football. Or I have to do certain things because – I don't have the offensive line that I had a few years ago. Right. So I think that does factor into some of the decisions he makes. But what you don't want to see is, and I see this with young quarterbacks is, and I think they made fun of Sam Darnold for this, is you don't want Derek Carr seeing ghosts. And I think Jack Del Rio, remember Jack Del Rio says sometimes Derek Carr uh, anticipates pressure that isn't there. That isn't I don't there. Think we're at, right. I, I don't think we're at that point yet. But once you start to see that happen, that's when it becomes a problem. Yeah, and and Gary went on to say, too, because it was a a pretty long email, he did say that he felt Carr um, was not comfortable in the pocket. I would agree with that. I don't think he looks comfortable there and and with the offense in general. And he he stresses the point, McDaniels McDaniels wants him in the pocket, but the pocket isn't good enough. So Carr feels the pressure, i.e. pressure maybe that's not there even at times when the pocket is okay. Um, so he says what needs to happen in my mind is you need to spend money on quality offensive linemen. That's no question. What? And he said, why not design rollouts? And if coverage is designed to take Adams away, then the plays need to be create, created to put Adams in motion. I think those are both good points. I think we need to put Gary. Is it Gary? Yeah. I think we need to put Gary in the booth along with Josh and <laughs> to help him. Get him a headset. Offensive. Yeah, get him a headset because I'm not advocating Madden players. I don't know if Gary plays Madden or not, but I think he brings up some good ideas here. But I want to talk. I also want to talk to Gary's point about Carr not being comfortable with the offensive line. Just took a glance at the starting offensive line for the Raiders. They allowed 12 pressures in total against the Titans. So you can't tell me that Derek Carr is not in, feeling that pressure and going. This offensive line is not very good. He's not, again, he's not going to say that at the podium. He's not going to say that publicly, but in his mind, he knows I have to do certain things. I may have to make certain plays. I may have to use my legs. I may have to, you know, speed my progression a certain moment because my offensive line is not giving me great pass protection. So I'm sure that plays back in his head when he's in the pocket. Well, when you look at the offense, though, even when they like there was there was a rollout for Derek Carr in this game against Tennessee on Sunday and it worked pretty well. Right. And I was going to say, we actually saw Derek Carr use his legs a bit in that game. It was good to see because I know a lot of people say, well, Josh McDaniels doesn't want Derek Carr running. And like I said on a previous show, it's not about running. It's about being able to move the pocket improvise and make off platform throws Derek Carr can do that but you have to really work with him on that that's not a natural part of his game but if you work with him on it as we've seen with Gruden he can do it he has the ability yeah he does and 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 for those of you who were calling us Derek Carr haters on yesterday's show there you go from positives hey <laughs> hey uh but no I mean I mean look I think some of these questions and again the, the Raider questions we appreciate you guys sending them all in um they're gonna border on negative because it, the, the fans I think are really disappointed the fans Mo they were excited going into last year before all the crap happened with Gruden and then of course everything else that went down coming off that COVID year but this year, more than any other year I've covered the Raiders, I felt the optimism, and, and it was a genuine... Even even the people who are usually pessimistic were optimistically pessimistic, if I can make that up. Uh, and it mm-hmm. seemed as though um, there was just this, this idea that they were going to come out, they were going to beat the Chargers, right? Then they're going to beat the Cardinals. And I had them at 3-0. So I was one of those people who, even on paper, not as a fan, but as an objective observer thought that they would do that. Um, is this one of those situations where fans have to adjust their expectations now? I mean, you said it yesterday's show that the season's not over. Yes, it looks grim for playoffs, but that doesn't mean that this team can't get on track and actually do something pretty spectacular. 
Do they need to, though, the fans? Do they need to tamper down their expectations? I like the subject topic because I talked about this after the loss. And a lot of people came in my, will enter my mentions and say, well, do you still have the Raiders at 10 and 7? Are you sticking by your projection? And I said, yes. But I said, if you had the Raiders winning 12, 13 games, you might want to adjust your expectations right now. Because I don't, they're not winning 12, 13 games, not with this football team, not with the start that they had. But I still believe that 10 wins is still attainable. Even 11, if, if they go on a big run, I think 11 wins is attainable. Well, of course, they would have to go on a massive run. But who knows? As I said on the last show, there are 15 weeks left in the season. All sorts of things can happen. On Monday, the Chargers had like five players Injured. on the injury report. Yeah. Rashawn Slater out for the season with a torn bicep. Joey Bosa is going to be out for a significant amount of time with a groin injury. Uh, J.C. Jackson, they said he's not responding well to his ankle surgery. So, again, that's just one team, but injuries are part of the game. So you're going to mm -hmm. have a lot of things go down. You still have the trade deadline. There's just so much that can happen with it over the next three, four months that you don't know where these teams are going to end up. So, again, if you have the Raiders winning 12, 13 games, adjust your expectations. But if you had them winning, if you were on the optimistic side and had them winning 10 and 11, I would still hold on to that. Absolutely. And also, I would tell you to hold on right there because we're going to take a quick break on this mailbag show on a Wednesday. It's Hump Day, Raider Nation. We're trying to help you get through. And then, of course, tomorrow, you're getting positive on this show right now, right? Mo and I answering these questions that are coming in all negative in a positive kind of negative way. But we're, uh, we're going to take a break. When we come back, we'll get to our final couple questions from you on the Raider Nation Mailbag Wednesday show here on Silver and Black today. Also, if you want to send us mail, what I recommend you do is you wait till after the game, send us the mail for the following show that week, and we'll get to it. You can mail us at mail at Silver and Black Today. That's all spelled out, silverandblacktoday.com. Mail at silverandblacktoday.com. Do that. We'll put it on next Wednesday's show. Everybody who appears, quote unquote, appears, gets their question read on the show, gets a free sticker, and then we pick one T-shirt winner each week. We're waiting on the delivery of those shirts, and we will send them out to you. So we already have, I think, four or five winners, and you could be the next winner today. So make sure you do that. Make sure you also subscribe to the podcast. Give us a five-star Five star, five. If you could do five and a half, we would ask you, but you can't. So five star rating up on uh, iTunes. We would appreciate that as well. We'll step aside. When we come back, we'll finish off the mailbag for this Wednesday. Take care, Raider Nation. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back, Raider Nation. It is a Wednesday. That means it's mailbag time. We're listening to you, Raider Nation. You send us the email. We read them online. We try to answer your question and give you the best answer we can. We certainly appreciate all of the feedback we get from you out there. Such great listeners, such great questions. Uh, they're a little more quiet this week, Mo, because of these three losses in a row. I'm ready for a win as much as the fans are because I just would like to have some positive energy. Yeah, I mean, um, just – context here i had the raiders going into the buy at three and two mm -hmm. right so this goes back to the why i'm not moving off my 10 win prediction yet i had the raiders going to buy a three and two so let's say they do beat denver it seems dicey now but let's say they do beat denver they have the chiefs i don't think they're going to beat the chiefs i had that as a loss but what if they do go into the buy at two and three and i had them at three and two mm -hmm. is that is that a reason to again move off of my prediction i'll be one game off essentially yeah. So, yeah. I, I, again, for the people saying, oh, Mo is too – it's funny, Scott, because it, in previous years, people go, oh, Mo, you're too critical. Lighten up a little bit. <laughs> now, when I have genuine optimism for the team, oh, Mo, you're too positive. And it's like this is why, as a writer, lesson to the writers listening out there. Go with whatever your prediction is. Of course, you adjust as things happen. But whatever your conviction is, positive or negative, Go with that and don't listen to the people chirping at you. Just believe in what your research says. Believe in your projections. Sometimes you're wrong. Sometimes you're right. It happens. That comes with the territory. Yep. You are. and and But here's the thing, Mo. Let me ask you this question before we get to the question that we have here from our listener, Zach uh, Maroon. Zach Maroon has got our question come up, so we'll get to it in a second, Zach. Um, Mo, 
This team loses against Denver, and then I'm going to assume a loss to Kansas City. Just, just saying. Yeah. If yeah. this team's zero and five again, people calling for Josh McDaniels to get fired. Do they forget about and and with all due respect, do they forget about the last several years under Al Davis and what a joke it was because he kept hiring and firing everybody? Do they really think that that's the approach? Even though things are not working right now, and an zero and five, they certainly would not be working. But they get to zero and five. What what would what would you do as the owner at zero and five? Just let it ride or does that mean you have to start thinking about some kind of changes where you got to nudge yourself in? What do you do? Something has to change. <laughs> if you start up 0-5 with the roster that you have, something's got to change. It's not going to be the head coach. Let's just be honest. I don't even right. listen to the people that go, oh, Josh McDaniels has to be fired if they start up 0-5. This is not going to happen. No. But something has to change, whether it's hiring another assistant to help Josh McDaniels or uh, Mark Davis calling Josh McDaniels. Says, Look, we got to add something. We got to either add or subtract from this coaching staff or we have we have to do something because this is not working. Whatever you're doing is not working. So you're going to need help. And you mentioned, I believe, the fam Hackett bringing in a kind of like a game day assistant to help game him manager. with the yeah. game manager to help him with decisions. Something like that would have to happen. Now, of course, it's not a game managing issue. It's more to me, it's more of a play calling problem. Correct. Maybe, uh, maybe, maybe bring in a run game coordinator, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> that will help. Hint, you hint. Know? Yes. So I, I think that is something that you would look at as a change because, again, there's no reason why the Raiders should have the fewest rush attempts league wide at this point in the season. Yeah, and and maybe maybe it's a case of maybe you let I know he's a young coach, but maybe you let Mick Lombardi call some plays because Josh McDaniels we know is the play caller, just like John Gruden was the play caller as well, uh, not Greg Olson. Maybe they allow the guy to mix it up a little bit just to do it. So we'll see. Hopefully, hopefully, we don't even have to cross that bridge, right? Hopefully, the Raiders can win two in a row, at least win one. Uh, yes. And maybe play well against Kansas City, even though being one and four would not be great. Let let's see improvement. That's what I want to see. I want to see four quarters of football. You know, that's what I said to people against Tennessee. You lose a game like that, and it's competitive all four quarters, and you play your best all four quarters and lose. Okay, it's when you're having outages that is the problem, and that's what they got to avoid against Denver on Sunday. All right, Zach Maroon has this statement and a question. I'm going to read this real quickly. Uh, Zach is from Maine. He says, I love you guys' show and look forward to it every week. I've grown up repping Raider Nation in enemy territory. I live in New England. Oh, gosh. Uh, I'm finally getting to see my first game. He's going for a bachelor party to Las Vegas. You better make it to the game, man. Uh, and, of course, we're going into it with an 0-3 record. I guess it's only fitting, and I hate when Raider fans say this because I feel terrible, it's the only fitting way to celebrate all 26 years of my Raider fandom. <laughs> A question. It feels to me like our issues are a lot deeper than just personnel or scheme. Sure, we have our fair share of poor play calling and botched execution against the board across the board. I feel like it's a bigger problem. Have you heard if there's any potential issue with team culture? And do you think that this in, this is an indictment on anyone in particular? I feel like John Gruden and Basaccia were known as leaders of men, and it feels like this wasn't a focal point for this new regime. Thanks, guys. Go Raiders. Mo, you mentioned this yesterday on the show, too, about leaders of men in that statement and, and how that was not stressed in this offseason like it was under the previous regime. Talk a little more about that in relation to Zach's question. Yeah, so I kind of got that idea when I heard Murph say there was no, he didn't see, remember, Murph is in Nashville, so he got, he was at the game, so he was able to see the players' body language, and he talked a lot about body language and looking at guys when the when the team was down he said there was no urgency there was no fire there mm -hmm. and to me that's a concerning thing because you're zero and two you're trying to avoid zero and three you're a team coming off of a uh you know a playoff appearance where's the fire and to me that goes back to leadership and that's why i guess that's why a lot of fans were saying maybe the Raiders should have kept rich versace because even though he was a longtime coordinator as an interim the team responded to him apparently because they were down six seven had a 6-7 record. They responded, bounced back. Now, of course, the players have to execute on the field, and that a lot of credit goes to Derek Carr for doing that with the skeleton pass-catching group that he had. But apparently, guys responded to Rich Basaccia's coaching style, and that's why that's part of the reason when you got the results. Now, when you're hearing that guys lack fire and urgency, to me, that goes back to the leadership and the coaching staff. 
What are you doing to get this team ready for game day and to keep them dialed in? Yeah, no question. And I think that you you see this and and clearly, and I keep, and I don't know if I'm articulating it correct, Mo, so tell me your thoughts. I just feel like there's some disconnect with whatever this coaching staff is preaching, whatever their mantra is, whatever they're saying to the team during the week, during practice, during game preparation, and even during the game, to, to build on Murph's point of not seeing a lot of fire on the sideline, whatever it is, is it too cerebral perhaps? I don't know what it is, but it just seems like it's not working. And whatever it is that's not working, the only way it will change is if the coaching staff addresses itself. You know, They needed a closed-door meeting with that staff together and say, okay, guys, what are we doing and why is it not working? Let's identify our approach. Here's A through Z, what we've been doing. Let's look at each one of them and figure out what's not working because something's not working. We're not getting through to veterans. We're not getting through to young people, young players. Our quarterback doesn't look on. We have star players who don't seem focused. What is the deal? How do we overcome it? That's the conversation that needs to happen. Remember, I believe it was last week you picked up on this and you said players were going, oh, this is not my job. That's not my job. Yeah. And you said that that's kind of like a, a sort of a red flag of where guys are like, oh, it's not my job. Goes back to your comment, connects to your comment now about a disconnect. Is there a disconnect between players and coach staff? Do they not like the game planning during the week? Is are you know certain things that they want in the game plan not included? Do they feel like their strengths are being used or utilized properly? And it's fair to question that right now. But I will say this too that it takes it takes some time for a culture to get hold of a locker room, especially true. when you're not winning games. Very so true. it's not gonna it's not gonna happen just like that with the snap of your fingers, especially when you start off 0-3. It just makes it that much harder. Winning cures all, but it's gonna take some time for a culture changeover because you had Rich Basaccia, who's known as kind of like a player's coach. And now, as you say, we have more of a cerebral coach staff with the Raiders where maybe they're not as warm and fuzzy. Maybe they're not writing letters to each individual player as Rich Basaccia is known to do. It's just all business. And for some guys, that doesn't play well. Some guys need a player's coach. Yeah. For some no guys, question. it does play well. So it, it it's going to take some time for that culture to take, again, take hold of that locker room. But again, winning will help expedite the process. <laughs> oh, yes, it would help a lot. But you're right. It's you have different talent, different personalities. These guys haven't had a lot of time. Remember, a lot of these veterans were with John Gruden for three seasons, four seasons, excuse me. And you get to know that, you know, the ins and outs, the, the what they're good at, what they're not good at, what bothers them, what doesn't bother them. Now you have guys off the street and they've had very little time with the new NFL rules. You don't get to spend a lot of time in even camp working out with guys as much. So it's hard to get to know them all. Uh, but uh, we certainly appreciate uh, the question there one, as well. One, yep. one quick one quick point, too. You have to understand, too, that John Gruden has been a head coach for decades. So he's been with True. different teams, so he's used to dealing with different personalities. Josh McDaniels, for the most part, I know he had that failure in Denver, and I believe he had one year as an OC with the Rams. But for the most part, he's been in that New England Patriots cocoon. So he's not used to dealing with a bunch of different personalities. He's used to a certain group of players. I know players go in and out with New England, but he's used to being in that one cocoon. And now he's he's the head guy on another football team. It could take him some time to, to mesh with his players. All right. Our final question of the day, Luis from El Paso. He's actually mailed in, uh, I want to say, a last month uh, for a question. So a repeat mailer. So we appreciate that very much. Luis asks, hey, I've noticed, too, the Raiders are significantly struggling at linebacker without Denzel Perryman. Although Div Di Divine Diablo has played well, I feel like this is also a reason why the defense is struggling. What do you guys think? Mo, um, no question up the middle, the Raiders are weak. Uh, we talked about it in the defensive line. At linebacker, they're getting some good play here and there, but I think he's on to a point there. Yeah, and this is why I don't understand why they didn't jump on Blake Martinez a little earlier. The, the Giants let him go, and as we know, Blake Martinez played under Patrick Graham with the Giants. I believe the Raiders brought him in for a visit, but they, they didn't sign him. But Denzel Perriman was definitely missed against Derrick Henry because you need a bigger a linebacker, a thumper, who could take down a, a big running back who's 6'3", 247 pounds. Now, as as you said, Devon Diablo has played well in spots. J.M. Brown played well in spots. 
but they definitely missed uh their 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 lead linebacker and Denzel Perryman. So to me, I this is just a philosophy that I have. When you have a really good middle linebacker, typically your defense is pretty good. Mm. So this is this this also I know this is a radio show, but this is my issue with the Chargers defense is it seems like they whiff on Kenneth Murray. He hasn't played well and he's also been hurt. And you saw their defense get shredded by the Jacksonville Jaguars. The weakest part of the Chargers defense is their linebacker core. I know Drew Tranquil has some good plays here and there, but their linebacker core is subpar. And to me, any team that has an issue at linebacker, and this goes this connects to the Raiders, what has been the one thing that Raiders fans have said year after year after year? Man, we need a good middle linebacker. We need a <laughs> linebacker. We need a game changer at linebacker. And what have the Raiders struggled with for the past, I don't know, decade? Having a good defense. Yeah. What's the common denominator? They don't have a good middle. They haven't had a consistent good linebacker. I think Perry Riley and Denzel Perryman are the two top names that come come to my the top of my head. Perry Riley kind of disappeared into the ether. Perry, as you know, had a Pro Bowl year last year. And defense still kind of struggled. But down the stretch, defense played well enough to get the Raiders into the playoffs. Because as we all know, as the offense struggled, the defense had the whole opposing teams under 28, 24 points. And they were able to do that. And they had a good middle linebacker. But now when you take that away, defense struggles again. It's not a coincidence. Yeah, that's why I, I fell back in 2019. Uh, I fell in love with Devin White. And I thought, boy, this would be a guy that would be great on the Raiders. And he, of course, went to the Buccaneers, won a Super Bowl. So, um, yeah, there's no question. And, Luis, a great question as well yep. uh, on that one because we have not talked about linebackers. And maybe we'll bring that up next show, too, and we take a look at what the Raiders are doing Just. There. And just really quick, think about yeah. the great, think about the really good defenses in recent history. What they think about the Bears defense? What did they? Who did they have? Brian Ehrlicher, Miami Dolphins defense had Zach Thomas. Zach the Thomas. Baltimore Ravens defense had Ray Lewis. It's not a coincidence to me. This again, this is just my philosophy. When you have a top tier middle linebacker, typically your defense is going to be pretty good, and the Rays are still searching for that. Yeah, and I, I mean, drafting linebackers, too, has not been – well, the draft has been poor the last five years anyway, for the most part. So what? that's uh, – One note, that's one note, one note. Saying. Sorry, but one note. I actually kind of wanted the Raiders to draft Michael Parsons. I know it seems like oh. hindsight 2020, but I I kind of – I wouldn't have been mad if the Raiders had drafted Michael Parsons. And you see what the Dallas Cowboys defense is able to do even without Dak Prescott on the field. Yes, although that game on Monday night was <laughs> – <laughs> 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 like a baseball score there for a little bit, uh, but uh, it, it ended nicely for the Cowboys. So, all right. Well, listen, um, that's going to do it for our mailbag show, but we need to pick a winner, Mo. So so we had uh, Gary again with a question uh, about uh, other Raiders and uh, where, where is it? Okay. Yes. Offensive line and Derek Carr. We had, of course, Zach with the question about the play calling and also – uh, the leader of men issue with the coaching staff changes and not being an issue. We had Luis with the last question on the linebacker uh, and John's question, which was about the play calling, which I think is huge for this team. The questions were good. Today. It's going to be hard they for were. me to pick, but I, I'll, I'll pick out two and then I'll let you choose the winner because they were oh, pretty sure. close today. Thank you. I, you. You know, you're, you're the, you're the pilot of the show. So I'm the, you the, I'm the shirt say. guy. <laughs> you're, you're the pilot. So I give you the final say, but I really okay. like the, uh, the play calling suggestions that we're giving about, you know, rolling out. That was Gary. Yeah. I, I, that was Gary. I, that was good. Yeah. And the linebacker question got me off on a tangent and, and it's just something that, hasn't been talked about enough. Mm -hmm. And I think certain people have touched on it, but the rate there is to me is no coincidence that the Rays have struggled to feel the good defense. And they've also struggled to find a consistent top tier middle linebacker. I think that should be talked about a lot more and it's good that he brought that to the forefront. Yeah. I, I, I like both those questions and I think it's neck and neck, but I'm going to give it to Luis with the linebacker question, Luis in El Paso, because, um, yeah, that is one that, I mean, even with all due respect to other journalists and hosts that cover the Raiders, I haven't heard anybody talk about it. So mm -hmm. uh, I, I appreciate Luis bringing it up because I think Mo and I are going to do a little more research and yep. we're going to bring this up on a, on a future show here real soon and talk about it because I think it was that good of a question and it kind of sparked that. When I got your email, Luis, I was like, man, he's right. He's uh, right. So we'll do that as we go. So Luis, we have your address. We will send you... 
a T-shirt along with a sticker for everybody else. A good Mo, I'm always energized by these mailbag question shows, even when the Raider Nation is not in its best mood Mm -hmm. because of the 0-3 start. We still show how great Raider Nation's football IQ is. Yeah, see, with like with Luis's question about the linebackers, it, I, you know what? I'll be honest. I haven't thought about it too much simply because Darren Zipperman was good last year. He was a pro bowler. But it just made it, as you said, sparked a thought to think like, hey, you know, think about the good defenses in recent history. Even the Legion mm-hmm. of Boom had Bobby Wagner. Like, think yes. about that. The good yeah. defenses have a, have a top-tier centerpiece, and the Raiders are searching, searching, haven't been able to find it. My worry with Perryman was that he's had an injury history. If you remember him with the Chargers, he was decent, but – not on the field enough, and exactly. he's hurt again, unfortunately. Yeah, and and they they call linebackers what of the defense, the quarterback of the defense, the don't they? The defense. Because mm-hmm. they're they're there putting everybody in place. The, the Raiders thought, even though he wasn't technically uh, a stereotypical middle linebacker, that's what they thought Corey Littleton was going to be. That he never really turned into as well. Mm-hmm. So so I think that they really need to focus on that in future years. But we will focus on it first, Luis. Congratulations on the shirt. Mo, we'll be back tomorrow for our Thursday show where we're going to look ahead at the Denver Broncos. We'll get you up to date on the latest Raider news and find out how things are going in Henderson as we move towards this game on Sunday against the Broncos. My friend, uh, I know uh, early parts of the week, Sunday through Tuesday, are incredibly busy. And then, of course, you're doing this show for Wednesday. Get some rest and we'll talk to you tomorrow. May, yeah, maybe we get Kirk Morrison on the show to talk linebackers because he was probably the last consistent ah. linebacker that the Raiders had. Maybe we can get him on the show and talk about the importance of the linebacker position. But I thank you guys for tuning in. There guys we go. We, that's a great suggestion. Mo just might have given you a little Easter egg, something of a hint. So uh, we'll check it out. But make sure you subscribe to the show. Make sure you join us on Thursday. Do us a favor, too, when you subscribe for the show on your iPhone or wherever you're listening to us, your iPad make sure you hit auto download. That way, every time a new show comes out, it goes right to your device. And when you're ready in the car, on the train, on the bus, walking, however it is you're going to work, school, wherever you may be off to in the morning, you can listen to us on your commute. We certainly appreciate that. For Mo Moten, I am Scott Colbranson. This has been Silver and Black Today, the mailbag edition for week four of the NFL season in 2022. We are an Odyssey original podcast, and we thank you, thank you, thank you for joining us. And we'll talk to you tomorrow again here on Silver and Black Today. Bye, everybody.